Hello, I'm Dr. Zachary Munn and today I'm with Dr. Tim Barker and we are going to talk about publication bias. Tim, thanks for joining me today. No, thanks for having me. So what is publication bias? Uh, well, to me publication bias is the uh, under-representation of uh, evidence that really should be available. So, so when you're doing a systematic review, obviously one of the key principles is that we try to find all the evidence. So you're saying that if, if our review might be at risk of publication bias, we might have missed some of, some of the evidence? Yeah, for, for whatever reason. Say we're only including studies in English, then there's a big chance that we've missed relevant studies to help us answer, answer our review question that might be written in uh, Chinese or, or Spanish or, or German. Um, now that's a form of publication bias. We are not uncovering the evidence that should be available because of these imposed limitations I see, I see. So if we're not searching uh, all languages, this is probably a bit of an issue and may represent publication bias. What else, what else might uh, result in publication bias? Uh, well, typically people think of publication bias as the, um, let's say, the malicious or the, or the evil suppression of data. Say we've got a uh, funded study that has um, uh, produced non-significant results uh, the funders of that study may suppress that, that paper. Um, but uh, in the example we gave before of only including English studies, publication bias can come from uh, many other uh, non-malicious mm -hmm. formats. So uh, say we are only retrieving studies from freely available um, sources. Yeah. Say we're only going to be including studies that are familiar to us. These are all forms of publication bias. Any uh, medium where we are not doing our utmost to uncover all of the available evidence, we'll uncover some, sorry, we'll propagate publication bias. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's a really interesting point. So it may be, we might not be searching uh, all languages, we may only be searching for articles that, that our institution pays a subscription fee for so we can access them, or we might just be including articles that we're familiar with, which sounds like a serious um, mistake in systematic reviews where we try to be as comprehensive as possible. But this, this issue about uh, some studies not being published, this is a really interesting one. And, and so you mentioned that there may be issues with a, a particular funding body or perhaps someone who has a vested interest in the results of a particular study not being published. This, this, this sounds quite concerning. Oh, well, it, it is. And um, we could speak at length about the, uh, the ethics behind um, the suppression of data. Um, and unfortunately, it is a problem that uh, not only we need to deal with as systematic reviewers and review methodologists, but uh, it has huge ramifications for the uh, well, uh, for society at large yeah. and for primary authors. Yeah, yeah, it does. So when when I think about uh, these issues, uh, it, it seems to me there's a couple of different reasons and. Obviously, there are those who have vested interests, so you could say the classic example is the pharmaceutical industry or medical device industry who, who aren't making the results of their trials public if they aren't going to support their commercial interests, um, which, is, which is really worrying, but, but you know, I, like to, I like to be somewhat optimistic and, and I like to think that perhaps this is changing. Um, with the work of groups like All Trials, for example, who try to make sure that all trials are registered and reported and the results made available. And in some jurisdictions, this, is, this, is, this has come a long way, which is, which is great. And I think we're in a better place now than we certainly have been in the past. But, but regardless, it's still, it's still an issue um, for sure. The other issue, I think, um, which, which is, I wouldn't say it's malicious, but and I know, I know colleagues and, and um, others who, who just have problems publishing their own studies. Um, yeah, do you so want to tell us about we, this a little bit more? Sorry. Uh, yeah, we might term this the, the file draw problem. Right. So let's say you're, you're a primary author and you, and you, do, a, you do a study and it's, it's not um, uh, particularly exciting. It's not going to uh, get a hold of citations. You might just let it sit in the file draw for whatever reason. And uh, I know I'm guilty of this, I know a lot of researchers are guilty of, uh, of this, uh, but it causes a real problem because mm -hmm. we have uh, an answer to a question 
that has gone undisseminated. And the point of uh, doing research at all is to disseminate your findings, to make it available to the, uh, to the greater public. Um, and while not always a, a, an evil or malicious uh, oversight, it is a, a, a common problem associated with many types of research that are not deemed to be uh, traditionally publishable. Mm -hmm. So this and this is this is a big this is a big issue as you say. So one of the one of the things we as researchers I guess need to realise is it is so important to publish the results of our work or disseminate the results of our work, no matter if we found a null finding or a negative result, um, because as you say, these are these are answers to questions. And if we're not putting or disseminating these these answers, then someone else might go on and then do this. Uh, and this is just unnecessary duplication and waste in research. Um, so we've got to do something to address this file draw problem. I think one way is to try to encourage researchers to always publish, but then we also need to consider some of the, I guess, the drivers behind the publication system, which is citations, etc. Not just from an author point of view, but an editor point of view. And editors, they may, <laughs> unfortunately, I've, I've been subject to this, I've had feedback from editors and peer reviewers who have said your results or your, your effect size in this study uh, seems to be too small to be of any real interest to the readership so we, we're not going to publish your work. It's very disheartening but as you say this is, this is going to contribute to, to, to further waste so I think the whole publishing industry uh, needs, to, needs to change that we, we that we will accept and encourage people to publish the results of your research regardless of a result. Of course we want the research to be of good quality, but the result, um, it, it shouldn't be the thing that drives whether or not an article is accepted, right? It should be, it should be the quality of the research itself. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so that brings me back to publication bias and system clues. We want to include everything. How do we know if we might have missed something in our review? How do we check for publication bias? What, what, what should we do? Well, there are, are formal methods to assess for publication bias. Um, and these would be the generation of what we would term final plots. Now, uh, final plots can be a uh, typically hard thing to interpret, and uh, I will be totally honest, they can really only be done if you have at least minimum 10 studies included in a systematic yeah. review and in a meta-analysis. So while we do have statistical procedures and techniques available to identify publication bias, they can be quite limited in their interpretation and in their overall use. Yeah. Really, the, uh, what I think the best thing for a reviewer to do to limit their publication bias is to be as inclusive as possible yeah. during their study selection process, making sure their search strategy is going to uncover every possible piece of literature available, not having these uh, research-imposed limitations as to how you will include studies, making sure that you are doing everything that you can to get the uh, evidence available. Fantastic. So, so, there, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a real trick, isn't it? Making sure that we use comprehensive searching, try not to limit our searching, try, as you say, try to find all the evidence that is available. This might even include doing things like contacting authors of trials with extra data, going to trial registries and trying to follow up with um, um, the, the funders or the people who are conducting trials if they haven't published, and doing everything we can to protect for publication bias because it seems like the way we actually analyze whether publication bias is possible through, through the funnel plots you mentioned, maybe not, they, they're not perfect techniques for every, every scenario. Okay. Hopefully everyone's learned a little bit about publication bias. Thank, Thank you.